In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Today is the midpoint of the fast. And on this day, we cease looking back to what we have left behind. And now we begin to look forward to what is ahead. Today, we look ahead and see at the end of the fast, the holy and life-giving cross of our Lord. This is a reminder for us of where we are headed. We are headed towards the cross, towards the tomb, and finally we arrive at the glorious and joyous resurrection. When we look at the cross, we see not just two pieces of wood that form the cross, but inevitably we see upon the cross our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us and for our salvation. When we look upon the image of the Lord on the cross, we see something that's very important, very profound, and in one sense almost unbelievable. We see the one who created the world, the one from whom flows our very being and life, the one without whom the world could not continue to exist, hanging upon the cross, rejected by his own people, betrayed and abandoned by his friends and disciples, suffering and dying on account of our sins. Now seeing this, some chose to mock him, and others chose to turn away from him, and still others called it a great tragedy. What do we see? when we look at the God-man Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. We could look and move to repentance, weep for our own sins, which brought this about. We could look ahead and see the victory, which is brought about by this sacrifice. But what we see above all is the supreme example of humility. The one true God, the maker of heaven and earth, the ruler and judge of all creation, voluntarily ascended the cross. He wasn't put up there against his will. But of his own will, he voluntarily submitted to the cross because of his love for us. He knew that the only way for us to be delivered from this captivity, the captivity of our sins and freed from the enslavement to the devil, was for he himself to descend into the stronghold of death and break the chains that bind us and destroy the gates of Hades that kept us captive and lead us out of Hades and into paradise. The only way into this place of our captivity was through death. And so, because of his love for us and for our salvation, he willingly entered that path. He humbled himself, setting aside his power, his authority, his right and privilege as our creator, and accepted instead the torturous death of the most wretched criminal. This is humility. By his humility, he came to the place where he could free us from our sins and lead us to salvation. If we would follow him to freedom from sin and death and the devil, we too must acquire this same humility. In the gospel, we heard our Lord's command to all those who would come after him to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. In these short and terse statements, he tells us how we can acquire this same necessary virtue of humility. Whoever will come after me tells us that first, we must choose to follow Christ. We must admit that we do not know the way to the kingdom of heaven, and so we willingly and willfully set aside our own ideas to follow the path that he sets out before us. Humility is first an act of our own will. We freely choose to follow him. We, he will not force us or coerce us in any way, nor does he impinge on the free will that he gave us. Jesus waits for us to choose on our own to come after him. Deny yourself. Now here we have the core of humility, for we have to give up our own self, but not the self that God created, that he deemed good, but rather the self that we have created, the self constructed out of lies and deceit. St. Nikolai Velimirovic describes this denial as follows. Adam also denied himself when he fell into sin, but he denied his real and true self. Seeking from men that they deny themselves, the Lord seeks that they deny their false selves. Putting more, put more simply, Adam denied the truth and clave to a lie, and now the Lord seeks of Adam's descendants that they deny the lie and cleave once more to the truth from which they had fallen away. Therefore, to deny oneself means to deny the deceitful non-being that has been imposed on us in place of our God-given being. We must deny the earth-boundedness that has, a, that has for us replaced spirituality and the passions that have replaced good works. The servile fear that has darkened us in our son, uh, darkened in us our sonship of God and grumbling against God that has killed within us the spirit of obedience to him. 
We must deny evil thoughts, evil desires, and evil deeds. We must deny the idolatrous worship of nature in our body. In brief, we must deny all that we reckon is me, but is in reality not us, but the devil, and sin, corruption, illusion, and death. Oh, let us deny evil habits that have become the second nature, for it is not our nature as God created it, but an accumulated and hardened illusion and self-delusion in ourselves. We often think of this self-denial as just saying no to sin. But as we see now from the words of St. Nikolai, self-denial is much more radical. It is a complete renunciation of the way of life that is centered on the world and sin, turning itself into a life that is centered on Jesus Christ, on reclaiming the life that God bestowed upon us at our creation. The next step is to take up our cross. This is difficult, for it involves not just a change of direction, but an admission that we are sick unto death and that we require healing of the master physician. This too requires humility on our part, for we, for we must now set aside our own efforts to heal ourselves and place ourselves completely in the hands of the great physician, our Lord Jesus Christ. To take up the cross implies suffering, but it is not suffering without a purpose. Rather, it is suffering that heals, the, heals, heals us of the wounds inflicted by sin and makes us whole again. Again, St. Nikolai describes this well. He says, what does it mean to take up your cross? It means the willing, sacri the willing acceptance at the hand of providence of every means of healing, bitter though it may be, that is offered. Do, do great catastrophes, catastrophes fall on you? Be obedient to God's will as Noah, as Noah was. Is sacrifice demanded of you? Give yourself into God's hands with the same faith as Abram when he had went to the sacrifice of his son. Is your property ruined? Do your children die suddenly? Suffer it all with patience, cleaving to your heart, cleaving to God rather in your heart, as Job did. Are you condemned for death to death for Christ's sake? Be thankful to God for such an honor like thousands of Christian martyrs. In seeking our crucifixion, the Lord is seeking the crucifixion of the old man, the man made up of evil habits and the service to sin. For by this crucifixion, the old animal-like man in us is put to death, and the new man made in God's image and immortal is raised to life. To take up your cross requires courage, for you do not know what you might face. And so it's necessary to trust God and his providence. He alone knows how to save us. He alone knows, knows how to heal us, so that when we put ourselves in his hands, we have always to hold on to the knowledge that he loves us, that he is healing us, so that we might be able to stand in his presence throughout eternity. This is important. Hold on to the knowledge that God loves you, for that knowledge will build you up in the courage to, and encourage to carry your cross to the very end. And follow me, that is, to follow Christ. Here is a great consolation. Our Lord knows that we've set, upon, set out upon this great journey from our enslavement to sin to the kingdom of heaven. He knows that it will be difficult at times to negotiate this journey, especially carrying the heavy cross that we do, to know where to turn and where to move ahead. And so he tells us, follow me. He knows the path. He knows where the turns are, where the potholes are, where the tripping hazards are. He knows which obstacles can be avoided and which ones must be overcome. And he also knows the best way to overcome those obstacles. And so rather than leave us to our own devices, he shows us the way that he knows, the path that he has cleared. He fills the potholes and levels the bumps so that our path might be smooth and straight. As long as we follow the path that he puts before us, we will not be in danger. But the moment that we try to do it ourselves, then we will stumble and trip and fall. When that happens, he doesn't abandon us, but as soon as we repent, he reaches out to lift us up, steady us on our feet, and put us again on the safe path that he has prepared. This is the lesson of the cross, the lesson of humility. Set aside your own ideas, your own plans, your own reasoning, and choose instead to come to Christ. Deny the self that is a lie and embrace the truth of Christ. Take up the healing discipline of the cross, trusting that God loves you. 
Follow the path that our Lord Jesus Christ has prepared for you. Not your own, but his. And that leads directly into his kingdom and into the company of all his saints. This is the way of the cross. Not a way of sorrow and despair, but a way of hope and joy. And most importantly, the way of God's love for you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.